Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. We also love hearing from our listeners. If you have any suggestions for future audiobooks, please feel free to leave a comment below. Or if you want to say hi, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have a great day. Subscribe to this channel today and join the Billionaire Romance Audiobooks family. Needing the Nanny A Daddy Next Door Romance Audiobook by Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Note we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the non-edited version and steamy scenes, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb My life was perfect as it was, hidden away in my palatial home, unbothered by the world. Until the day it all came screeching to an unpredictable halt. What did I know about raising babies? Nothing that's what. Moreover, I didn't want to know anything about the subject. The kid on my doorstep wasn't mine, and I didn't care what his crazy but absentee mother has to say about it. But just like the unexpected delivery which had spun my life on its axis, Troyan was just as surprising when she entered my life. Chapter 1 Troyan Sammy Please I'm begging you put your shoes on. I pleaded, for what was maybe the sixth time in ten minutes. We're going to be late. I didn't add the word again, even though it was implied. Coral didn't put her shoes on. Sammy argued, and I rolled my eyes all the way up to the sixteen-foot ceiling, my gaze resting on the intricate wainscoting on the balcony above as I tried to find my patience. Mr. Thompson peered down at me, a bemused look on his face. How's it going down there, Troyan? He teased and I forced myself to give a smile. Great. I replied with feigned enthusiasm. We're almost ready to go. He snickered at my obvious lie as he watched the twins run amok, shooting one another with fake laser guns. His lighthearted attitude did a lot to help my mood. Even on stressful mornings such as this, I couldn't deny that I was very lucky to be working for a couple like the Thompsons. Sammy, I tried again, switching tactics this time. All your friends are waiting for you at school. You want to see your friends, don't you? That seemed to stop the six-year-old for a minute, his blue eyes resting on my exasperated face as he contemplated what I'd said. That's true, he agreed, finally hurrying off to oblige my request as I quietly exhaled and turned my attention to his sister. Coral? Sammy's putting his shoes on now. Shouldn't you do the same? The adorable redhead turned her guileless eyes on me and gave me that sweet smile that always warmed my heart. Okay, she replied in her quiet way, heading off to join her willful brother. I exhaled with relief. I'd already known that if Sammy went, it would be no issue getting Coral to follow suit. After all, I wasn't new to this. Mr. Thompson broke into a slow clap from his spot on the balcony, a wide grin on his aging face. You have it down to a science now, he teased me and I laughed. There's a method to everyone's madness, I replied lightly, heading toward the foyer to ensure that Sammy hadn't grown distracted on his quest to find his shoes. You certainly have a way with them, Mr. Thompson chuckled, turning to descend the floating staircase and meet us in the entranceway. Sammy had managed to put his tennis shoes on the wrong feet while Coral sat primly on the stairs. Ready and waiting, she had her hands folded neatly over the lap of her overalls. Let me fix that for you, I told Sammy, but that was easier said than done, of course he fought me. No. This is the way they go, he insisted, scooting out of my reach. I stifled a sigh, determined not to let my employer see my chagrin. To my extreme gratitude, his father intervened. Sammy, if you don't listen to Troyan, I'm taking your iPad away. The boy looked at me balefully, as if I had been the one to utter the empty threat. I knew full well that Mr. Thompson wouldn't follow through, if he was even home this evening, he wasn't likely to remember the punishment. The man traveled on business so much, 
I was surprised to see him at all. Okay, Sammy grumbled, permitting me to adjust his footwear. I glanced at Mr. Thompson with a thankful smile. All right. I cried, happy that the morning ritual had been completed. If we left in the next 10 seconds, I might actually get the twins to school on time for once. Let's go. I shuffled them out of the house after they kissed their father goodbye and ushered them toward the minivan, which was mine to use exclusively. It was just one of the many perks of the job at the sprawling, gated mansion in Virginia Beach. Others included a monthly spa package and my own suite, including a fireplace and private bathroom with a jacuzzi tub. I would have taken the job for the jacuzzi alone, which I used abusively. It wasn't a bad gig I had going on with the Thompsons. I'd been with the family for just over a year, and I would do just about anything to keep it going. Granted, the twins could be a handful at times, but I'd dealt with much worse with my last family. I had no problems with children throwing temper tantrums, but when the parents followed suit I had zero patience. The last house I'd worked at, the single mother had been a diva from the seventh circle of hell, and I'd been happy to leave her for the Thompsons. As I secured the kids in their booster seats and closed the door, a movement caught my eye through the shrubbery separating the Thompsons' property from the house next door. House was the wrong word. The Thompsons lived in a mansion, and that was impressive enough. Ash Morris lived in a palace, a colossal structure that seemed to span half the beachfront. I grudgingly admitted that it was a gorgeous piece of property. It was a stunning combination of Greek and Mexican architecture, at least from what I could tell from the brief glances I managed to get from the beach or through the live oaks and Japanese climbing ferns. Mrs. Thompson had once told me that Ash Morris had designed the house himself. From what I'd read online, Morris was a nouveau riche tech genius. He'd made his first fortune on an app that tracked anything and everything, from a missing set of keys to a kid and everything in between. Gone were the days of amber alerts and posters for lost pets. With a tap of a finger, a GPS tracker could find that missing tennis shoe hiding under your bed. Looking toward the motion, I caught a glimpse of his shocking blonde hair through the branches. A familiar, embarrassing shiver of warmth shot through me. I had never said two words to the man, though not for lack of trying on my part. On the occasions where I did manage to catch his bright blue eyes in passing, it was as if he looked right through me. Not that it was surprising, really, I was the hired help, not his peer. Still, a good morning greeting every now and then wouldn't have killed him. It bothered me that I found him so attractive when it was clear that his beauty was only skin deep. My eyes can't form an opinion on personality, I reasoned, unintentionally rising on my tiptoes to catch a better look at him. I could just make out the crown of his head but found myself longing to catch a glimpse of his profile, the arc of his regal cheekbones, or a peek at his full mouth. I would have settled for the bulge of his neck muscles too, but he had already disappeared from my field of vision. Looking for something? I gasped and whirled at the sound of Mr. Thompson behind me, my pale skin flushing crimson at being caught. No, no. I cried, my voice sounding just a bit too loud. I just thought I saw something. Something like Ash Morris, he asked dryly. Oh, of course. I said, playing dumb. It must have been the neighbor. He shook his head and unlocked his Mercedes with the fob. You should probably get going he reminded me. The kids are going to be late for school. Embarrassed, I nodded quickly and apologetically. Yes, sir. You know, Troyan, you can call me Nathan. And my wife would love it if you'd call her Lisa, he told me, shaking his head as he slipped into the driver's seat. I did know that. He and Mrs. Thompson had brought it up numerous times, but it didn't feel right, no matter how often they insisted. They were older than the average parents of six-year-old twins, much older. I wasn't clear if the twins were a result of in vitro fertilization or a traditional surrogate, and I dared not ask something so devastatingly personal. Either way, I knew they were both in their sixties. I didn't feel right about calling them by their given names when they were the same age as my own parents, respect your elders and all that. Of course, I would never say anything like that to their faces, and Mr. Thompson wasn't waiting for a response anyway. He waved to us and drove off, 
no doubt on his way to close another million-dollar business deal somewhere. It occurred to me that I hadn't seen his wife that morning. However, that didn't mean much in a house as big as the Thompsons. Mrs. Thompson could have been anywhere in the vast mansion, from the gym to her California king bed, which she did not share with her husband. The rich are such weird creatures, I thought dryly. I tried to imagine myself as a late middle-aged woman, raising two young kids and juggling a career, while systemically ignoring her husband. But none of that was my business. My job was to care for their ginger-haired twins and mind my own affairs, which wasn't difficult to do. I had very little with which to concern myself. Sammy banged on the window and I snapped to attention. I had wasted more time standing in the driveway in the mounting Virginia sunlight than Sammy had putting on his shoes. Flipping my shoulder-length blonde hair over my shoulder, I flashed the kids a smile as I opened the driver's side door. Ready. I called, and they nodded in unison. Time to face the day. Chapter 2 Troyan. It wasn't really my job to clean up, but I couldn't sit back and do nothing while Emma fussed around the house. The kids were in school so we made a routine of it, even though I'm sure my presence drove Emma crazy. She had given up asking me to stop helping, because she realized her pleas were falling on deaf ears. She liked to joke that if I kept helping her then she'd be out of a job, but I wasn't trying to annoy her, I simply didn't do well with idle hands. Besides, I knew being the only housekeeper in a place this size couldn't be easy, so I was happy to help her when I could. I was in the living room, picking up a pile of toys that the twins had managed to unearth in the short time between waking and leaving for school, when the weather took a turn. The sun outside the long rectangular windows disappeared, a mass of clouds rolling in like some dark omen. You know that we have a housekeeper, right? Mrs. Thompson asked, shaking her head as she appeared in the entranceway of the open concept living room. No offense, Troyan, but I think you cause Emma anxiety when you do this. She has a very particular way of doing things, and I'm sure she just redoes it all when you're not looking. I sighed and lifted my head, smiling wanly. I know, I confessed, looking at the refined woman before me. But I can't help myself. It's been so different since the kids started full days at school. There's only so much Instagram I can handle. Mrs. Thompson laughed and nodded, stalking toward me in a red tailored suit. She was formidable, tall and rigid, as if there was a steel rod in her spine. In all my time working for her, I had never seen her look less than perfect. Her makeup was always subtle but stunning, her short black bob gleaming without a hair in place. If it was a wig, it was a damned good one, but I found it hard to believe that anyone could manage that kind of gleam with a dye job. Mrs. Thompson studied me with pensive brown eyes. I like you so much more than I liked the last one, she informed me and I grinned to myself. It was something she said often, but I still felt proud every time she said it. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Well, except for that, she scowled. What will it take to get you to call me Lisa? That was the first time I realized that it genuinely bothered her, and I wondered why. Did it make her feel old? I was contrite. I'm sorry. Lisa. I offered, almost choking on the word as I said it. A grin appeared on her face. Now was that so hard, she chuckled, her face softening slightly. She didn't look as old as her husband, but I knew they were only a couple years apart. I wondered if she'd had Botox, but again, it was none of my business. When it came to looks, she couldn't have been more different from her husband. I always found it a little odd that she cared so much about her appearance when her husband didn't seem to care at all. You're a good southern girl, Troyan. In some ways, you remind me of myself before I met Nathan. My brow furrowed, sensing a little wistfulness in her voice. It was incredibly difficult for me to envision Lisa Thompson as a good southern girl. She was a shrewd businesswoman, one who lived independently even with a husband and strove for perfection. But, who was I to argue? Thank you ma'am, I replied, unsure of how else to respond. I hoped she meant it as a compliment, but sometimes it was hard to tell with her. Her husband was much easier to read, but I found men usually were. She was staring at me, and it was starting to make me uncomfortable. 
I wondered what was going through that gleaming head of hers, but I didn't need to wait very long to learn what she had in mind. I need a favor, she explained. Well, actually, a friend needs a favor. Of course, Mrs., I stopped mid-sentence as I caught her death stare. Lisa, what can I do to help? I'm only suggesting this because you seem to be bored when the kids are in school, and frankly, I'm getting tired of hearing Emma complain about your help. It's ultimately your decision, but I think he would appreciate it, given his circumstance. I eyed her curiously. Who? I asked, intrigued by this little mystery. What circumstance? Our neighbor, Ash Morris. He needs help caring for his young son, and since you're mostly free during the days, I thought you might be interested in taking the job. You would be well compensated for your time, of course. I gaped at my boss, her words not making much sense. His son. I echoed. Since when did the hot guy next door have a son? I'd never seen a child on the property, or any sign of one. There were no toys or bikes or screaming temper tantrums carrying over from his place. Granted, the walls were thick and Ash seemed to value his privacy. But still, hiding a kid back there? Yes. I'm not sure what the boy's name is, but he's only eight months old. He's very sweet. An infant? I choked. I didn't even know he was married. It was an antiquated thing to say, I know, but it was the first thing that flew out of my lips. He's not. Lisa Thompson looked at me, as if I had grown another head. But I don't believe that's a prerequisite to having a child. Of course not. I said quickly, shaking my straight, honey blonde hair. Ah, uh, what about Sammy and Coral? You will still live here, and see them off to school in the mornings and pick them up in the afternoons. On weekends, you can bring the baby here if you want. If you can handle it, that is, and if Ash wants you on the weekends. We can work it out. I could not stop staring at her like a deer caught in the headlights. The longer I stood there in silence, the more her brow knit. There's no pressure, Troyan. If you don't want to. No, I do. I interrupted before I could stop myself. You're right. It'll be good for me to do something during the day. Not to mention that I could use the extra cash. I didn't intend to be a nanny for the rest of my life. I was saving up to go to college and buy a car. Every cent would help me move closer to my goal. Excellent. Why don't you go over there right now and see what he needs? I'm not going to lie to you, Troyan. Ash is pretty stress out. He looks like he's about to pop a gasket whenever I see him lately. I thought she was supposed to be selling me on the idea. It's fine, I replied, rising from the faux fur carpeting on the floor. I dealt with Sammy in the aftermath of his sugar theft, remember? After that, I think I can handle anything. She laughed and then grimaced at the reminder, shaking her head. That boy, she sighed. I don't know. They say that girls are sweet when they're small, but end up giving you the most trouble in the long run. Well lucky me, I get to experience both joys, Lisa chuckled. Go ahead. I'll call Ash and let him know you're heading over. I nodded, feeling my pulse quicken slightly as I rounded the corner and headed toward the front door. Pausing at the mirror, I quickly checked out my reflection to make sure I looked presentable. My hair was slightly disheveled, but there wasn't too much I could do about that right now. Not when Ash was expecting me. My gray eyes shone back at me with their usual impish twinkle. I could never quite figure out why eyes gave off such a look because I never had a devious thought in my head. Well, not often anyway. My face was rosy from the sun after spending the weekend with the kids at the beach, and while I wasn't winning any beauty pageants in my Lululemon tracksuit, my lean, athletic figure looked just fine beneath the pink and white material. Not exactly job interview material, but it'll have to do, I told myself, hurrying out of the house. As soon as I stepped foot onto the interlocking drive, a crash of thunder erupted over my head, making me jump almost out of my skin. I peered up into the sky and wondered how the storm had rolled in so quickly. It had been beautiful and sunny just that morning. Raindrops began to fall as I rushed through the walkway gate and around the live oaks across the sidewalk. Just beyond, 
I could see the waves crashing along the shoreline of Virginia Beach as the waters of the Atlantic swelled and families hurried like ants to find shelter. The day had turned on them unexpectedly, and the beachgoers all watched as their belongings got soaked by the sudden storm. I was drenched by the time I reached Ash's gate. I jabbed the intercom impatiently, shivering as my t-shirt clung to my frame. There was no audible response, but the wrought iron gate swung inward and I bolted up the driveway. I sprinted the fifty feet to the front door, hoping it would be open and ready for me, but I had to stop and wait under the Roman columns for someone to come. When no one appeared for a solid minute, I used the lion's head knocker to announce my arrival, feeling slightly irritated. Obviously, someone knew I was there, they had let me inside the gate. I strained my ears, trying to hear any sounds coming from the other side of the heavy door, tapping my foot as rain streaked from my hair down my back and into my pants. My teeth were chattering lightly, and I was about to knock again, when the door abruptly swung open, causing me to fall forward into the foyer. Startled, I tried to regain my footing as I slid over the shining marble, looking up at Ash Morris in surprise. He made no move to help, but instead eyed me up and down with obvious contempt. What are you doing here? he demanded, folding his arms over his broad chest. At his rude words I finally managed to collect myself, rising to my full height of five-six. He still seemed to loom over me. I, the question had taken me aback. I guess Mrs. Thompson hadn't gotten around to calling after all. Mrs. Thompson said you needed some help with your baby? His mouth parted slightly, and I thought he was going to contradict me. Maybe a part of me hoped he would, because the way he glared at me made me regret agreeing to even speak with him. Yeah, he finally agreed, spinning away from the entranceway. I stared after him, unsure if he expected me to follow. I decided it was safest to remain in place. He stopped just before he disappeared through the hall that presumably led to the right wing of the house and stared at me like I was an idiot. Are you coming or what? he snapped. Trying to shake off my shock at his aggressive attitude, I nodded quickly and hurried to join him. Christ, you're dripping all over the place, he groaned but he continued down the back hallway. Suddenly I heard the high shrill cry of a baby. I looked ahead to see that Mr. Morris was standing in front of the pantry door, waiting for me to catch up. He's in there, he told me. Good luck. With that, he spun around and walked away. At first I thought he was kidding, and I stood there like a moron as the baby's cries increased beyond the closet door. But as the pitch reached a deafening tone, I could stand it no longer, and I pushed the closet open to investigate. Another rumble of thunder seemed to accentuate my movement, as if forewarning me of what I might see. I willed myself not to overreact, telling myself that I wasn't living in a horror movie and therefore shouldn't expect anything horrific. I exhaled with relief when I realized that I was neither standing in a pantry nor was the child alone. The room served as a guest room or maybe a staff bedroom and the boy was wrapped in the arms of the housekeeper. The poor woman was trying to silence him with coos and a sing-song tone, but she looked exhausted. I looked over my shoulder, fully expecting Ash to appear with a smirk on his face, but he was nowhere to be seen. He had just left me, a total stranger whose name he probably didn't even know, to take care of his baby boy. What kind of jerk would do something like that? Chapter 3 Ash no matter where I went in the house, the kids' cries echoed in my ears. It was impossible, of course. The walls were too thick for that, and the distance between my office and my housekeeper Cynthia's on the main floor was too large for sound to travel that clearly. There was only one explanation as to why I might be able to hear the infant, even after jamming earplugs in my ears. It wasn't a thought I wanted to dwell on. My frustration was growing. I had to get out of there, but before I could consider moving from my high-back leather chair, there was a knock on my office door. What? I snapped. Cynthia poked her head in, her eyes narrowed. Your nanny is going home. She has to pick up the Thompson kids. Why are you telling me this? I demanded. Cynthia grunted, as if I should already know the answer to my own question. I guess that means you're not going to tend to your son then 
she replied caustically, and I felt shivers slide up and down my arms. He's not my son. Stop calling him that. Well, he sure as hell isn't mine, Ash, and I don't know how I got stuck with babysitting duties. Our eyes clashed but in true Cindy form, she didn't falter. I have a nanny for the daytime now, I answered through clenched teeth. Kids that age slept all night, didn't they? What more did she want me to do? Ash, it's been three days. His mother is nowhere to be found. You can't just toss him around like he's a football. Cynthia, I already told you I'd pay you double for this. What else do you want from me? I want you to spend some time with Will. He's a sweet little. I have work to do, I interrupted coldly. Close the door behind you. Of course she didn't move, but instead folded her arms over her ample chest in disgust. You're gonna need a better plan than this, Ash, she warned. What if Colette doesn't come back? Of course that con artist will be back, I snorted. She thinks she's walking into a major payday. Ash. Cindy, get out. I roared, rising angrily and placing my hands firmly on my desk. Calling up the glare I used when negotiating million-dollar business deals, I stared her down for all I was worth. Finally she relented, spinning to leave me alone in the office with my thoughts. I knew I was being unreasonable, especially toward her. After all, it wasn't Cindy's fault that my ex had dropped her infant son off on my doorstep three days earlier and then disappeared without a trace. When I'd answered the door that day, the last thing I'd been expecting was to be greeted by a helpless infant. All she had left was a note pinned to the child, with some horseshit written on it about the baby being mine. I'd barely read it. That kid is not mine. I'd growled hotly, staring at the chubby-cheeked infant. He hadn't seemed to care about my anger though, and had simply puckered his wet lips and eyed me with stunningly blue eyes. He looked nothing like me and the math was all wrong anyway, wasn't it? I couldn't think straight in my fury, grabbing my cell phone from the back pocket of my jeans and scrolling through my contacts for my ex's number. Of course it was disconnected when I called it, which simply made me angrier. I whipped the cell against the floor, the sickening sound of the screen cracking only adding to my roiling emotions. On cue, the baby began to cry. Oh Ash, you need to calm down, Cindy chided me, scooping the kid from his car seat. Babies are sensitive. They pick up on moods. Call Child Protective Services and get this kid out of my house, I yelled. The child wailed louder and my head began to pound. You're not thinking. Cindy snapped, rocking the unsettled baby in her plump strong arms. Her porcine face contorted with worry and she shook her head. How the hell can I think when someone's just left a baby on my doorstep? I yelled. Screw this. You take him. I'm calling CPS. Ash don't, my housekeeper yelled and I found myself freezing in mid-step. Cynthia had been with me since the beginning. I'd met her when my family was renting a small bedroom in a house in Richmond, my family hardly having a pot to piss in or two cents to rub together. She'd also lived there at the time, and she'd picked up extra cash from the landlord for cleaning up after all the tenants. We'd become friends pretty quickly, especially after she decided to take pity on me by bringing me sandwiches and candy to keep me sustained. I'd always known I was going to design something great my aptitude for computers having started back before I could talk. Actually, that's not true. I could talk, I'd just chosen not to until I was almost five. And Cindy had been my only support during that time. I owed her a lot, and when I'd finally cashed in on all my potential, I'd brought her with me, though she'd insisted on earning her keep. She was more than a housekeeper to me, and she had her own suite and bathroom. She made her own schedule, and she had full run of the house. Somehow, she always managed to keep the 15,000 square foot mansion in pristine condition. I secretly suspected that she hired a cleaning crew when I was out of town, but that was none of my business. I liked having her around. She was like the older sister I'd never had, but that also meant she knew how to get under my skin like no one I'd ever known. I could hear the ice in her voice, and I waited. What if he is yours, Ash? she asked. Look at his eyes. They certainly look like yours. I swallowed the lump in my throat, because I'd had precisely the same thought. 
but I wasn't willing to just accept that. He's not, I said flatly. He can't be. You don't sound convinced, she replied softly. I turned to look into his eyes. He's not, I insisted flatly. I'm calling CPS. And if by some chance he happens to be yours, Ash, do you really want CPS involved? Do you know the kind of mess that could create? I felt my back tense. I didn't need a reminder about how CPS operated. I had very nearly ended up in the system myself several times when I was a kid. I probably would have been better off if I had been put into foster care, I thought, eyeing the kid as if justifying why I would call. But ultimately, I knew that Cindy was right. I couldn't do that, not until I knew for sure if he was mine. But holy hell! I did not want to be a father, and certainly not if Colette Patrick was the mother. That woman was a walking train wreck. You deal with him, I told Cindy in the end. I can't deal with this. That had been three days ago, and I was no closer to tracking down Colette. The woman had disappeared off the face of the earth. There was a knock on the office door, and I looked up, surprised to see Cindy again. I could tell she wasn't alone. Who else is here? I demanded, as the door swung inward tentatively. To my surprise, the neighbor's nanny stood in the doorway. What was her name again? Troyan. I thought you went to pick up the twins. I'm leaving now, she said quietly. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was just wondering if you want me to come back tomorrow after I take the Thompson kids to school. She and Cindy stared at me expectantly, and I found myself meeting her slate gray eyes for the first time. I'd seen her dozens of times in passing. I'd have to be blind not to notice a pretty blonde with long legs and an eternal golden tan, but she was young. And the neighbor's nanny. So off limits, pretty much. Sure, I'd checked her out when she wasn't looking. No red blooded male could resist watching her tiny, perfectly round butt as she bent over to secure the kids in the car, or peering at her perky, firm cleavage as she lounged around the pool in a bikini. But I had never gotten close enough to look her in the eyes. Better to stay away from temptation, I'd always thought. However, now that she was right in front of me, I was stunned to realize how lovely her irises were. Obviously, she had more than just an attractive body. I wrenched my gaze from hers, a foreign sense of embarrassment sweeping up through the back of my neck, knowing that I'd stared at her too long. Ash. Cindy growled. She's waiting for an answer. I don't care what you do, I muttered turning my attention back to the computer screen. Cindy exhaled and pulled Troyan out of my office. If you could come tomorrow, you'd be doing me a huge favor, I heard her say to the girl as the door closed. Don't mind Ash. He's very busy with work. Work was the least of my concerns at that moment. I sat back, steepling my hands and willing myself to be calm. I had procrastinated on the matter long enough. I had to figure out what to do with this baby, since it was clear his mother had abandoned him. Again my ears filled with the sound of low plaintive wailing, and I groaned to myself. I buried my face in my hands. But oddly, when my eyes closed, it wasn't baby Will's face that lingered in my mind. Instead, I saw a pair of mischievous grey eyes smiling back at me. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair, trying to adjust the new tightness I was experiencing in my crotch. Oh no you don't. I yelled at myself. Hands off the babysitter. Chapter 4 Troyan As I drove the twins home from school, my mind was anywhere but on their mindless chatter as they chirped about their day. Usually, it was my favorite part of the afternoon. I loved bonding with them and asking them questions about what they'd done and who they'd talked to. Listening to little kids' chatter was just about the most entertaining thing I could ever hope to be doing, and the twins never failed to amuse me. But that day, I couldn't tear my mind away from baby Will and his wretched father. How can he treat an infant like that, and where the hell is Will's mother? I wondered. What kind of mother leaves their baby with a man who has no interest in being a dad? Cynthia had been great walking me through the makeshift routine she had started with Will over the past few days. 
and while I was dying to ask questions about what I'd walked into, I kept my mouth shut. I'd been working with wealthy families long enough to know that asking questions was a big no-no. I was on a need-to-know basis, and it was clear that in Will's case, I didn't need to know anything but how to change a diaper. It had only taken me five minutes to calm him down, and Cynthia had been awed by my ability to do it so quickly. You have a way with babies. I guess so, I replied, snuggling the warm bundle to my body. He smelled so sweet. He's what eight nine months old? Ah. Uh. Cindy looked embarrassed and looked down. Something like that. I narrowed my eyes but didn't comment on her lack of knowledge about her boss's son. Cindy and I had spoken many times since I'd started working for the Thompsons, unlike me and Ash. She was a friendly woman with a warm smile, and while she was a little on the heavy side, she was quite attractive. When Mrs. Thompson had originally told me about the baby, I had wondered if Cindy was the mother. She was the only woman I had ever seen at the Morris house. But it became obvious very quickly that she wasn't. It's nice of you to agree to help, she told me. Lisa said she wasn't sure if you'd be up for it. It all made sense then. Mrs. Thompson hadn't spoken to Ash at all, she had spoken to Cindy. Are you kidding? I replied lightly. Have you smelled this kid? Troyan, you're not listening to us. Sammy complained, knocking me out of my daydream. Of course I am. I'm listening very carefully. Then what did I just say? I hated being outsmarted by children. It made me feel dumb. Lucky for me, I knew there were only a handful of subjects that Sammy usually brought up. You were talking about playing soccer with Ben and Billy, I said. You were listening, he cried and I exhaled, glancing at him in the rearview mirror. I shouldn't be so distracted while spending time with the twins, especially while driving. They were my real job, my main priority, not some self-centered jerk who hid his kid in a maid's room with his housekeeper. How many bedrooms are in that mansion anyway? Twelve? Fifteen? And he couldn't put his child in a nicer place than that? My fingers were clenching the steering wheel, my knuckles growing white as I pulled up to the Thompson house. The gate was open at Ash's place, and I wondered if Will's mother was there. The curiosity was burning a hole in my gut. Mrs. Thompson's car was in the driveway, and the kids flew from the van into the house to find her. Instead of rushing after them as I normally would, I lingered on the drive, peering over the shrubbery for a glimpse of what was going on. Unfortunately, my attempt at sleuthing didn't reveal anything. I didn't see anyone. It was just odd to see the gate open, as if Ash was expecting someone. Or maybe I was just reading too much into it. Looking for something? I yelped and spun, my face flushing bright red as I looked at Mrs. Thompson. I know. I gasped. I. I didn't even know how to explain what the heck I'd been doing. This was not the kind of neighborhood where spying and nosiness might be tolerated. You know, you can just go over there and knock on the door now, she chuckled. You don't have to check out Ash from a distance anymore. I thought my chin might hit the floor. What? I gasped. I, I don't check out Mr. Morris. Sure you do, Lisa replied, unlocking her car door. She reached into the passenger side to retrieve some file folders, before grinning at me. Oh, don't look so shocked, Troyan. You're a beautiful girl, and he's an attractive older man. It's a tale as old as time. Mrs. Thompson. I choked. Please stop. Suit yourself, she giggled. But if you don't act on it, maybe I will. She winked at me and disappeared into the house, leaving my gut twisting in a dozen different ways. She's just kidding. She's a married woman. She's 60. He's not interested in Mrs. Thompson. He's at least 20 years younger than she is, without a wrinkle on him. I could hardly stop staring at his rippling arms as he leaned over the desk to look at me. Suddenly, I was confused. Why did I care what Mrs. Thompson did with Ash? He was a world-class jerk and a terrible father. And if Mrs. Thompson would cheat on her husband with him, then maybe they deserve each other. 
I turned back and stormed into the house to collect the twins. I had to distract myself before I let the question fully form in my mind and humiliate me further. But it was too late. If I don't care what they do, then why am I so angry? Chapter 5 Ash I swirled the spoon around in my bowl, eyeing the cornflakes as they sank deeper into the bowl of milk. I wasn't hungry, but I knew I had to eat something. I didn't deal well with hunger, and I knew if I missed breakfast, then I'd be miserable all day. Even if I ate an early lunch, I'd be off. There was nothing to do but force the soggy mess into my stomach and get back upstairs to work. It was a quirk, but it was one of the more minor ones I'd acquired over the years. Maybe that was why I was still single, too many quirks. Yeah, that's the only reason. Women can't handle your endearing quirks. I took another spoonful of slop and pushed the bowl away. It was all I could take. If that meant my day was going to go downhill, so be it. I'd had so many shitty days this week, what was one more? I was nearly finished developing the software for another app, one that would probably piss off a lot of people, but who cared about being PC anyway? If you weren't doing anything wrong, then you wouldn't have to worry that your significant other was tracking you without your knowledge, right? Okay, so that marketing strategy might not fly, but marketing was not my game, technology was. I rose from the stool at the marble island and dropped the bowl into the sink. Before I could steal up the back stairwell, I heard a tinkling giggle flow through the hallway. I turned instinctively and cocked my head toward the sound, a slight shiver flowing through me. It was the nanny, of course. Cindy sure as hell didn't laugh like that. But what was she laughing at? I padded across the kitchen floor, my Adidas shoes moving soundlessly over the hardwood floors and looked out toward the foyer. You are the best boy, aren't you? Aren't you? The blonde cooed, leaning over the stroller, using her index finger to poke the baby's nose playfully. Suddenly, I heard what had made her laugh so sweetly. The second her fingertip made contact, the child burst into peals of laughter, deep chuckles straight from his belly. The sound was cartoonish and hilarious, and although I couldn't see his face, I could envision what his chubby little cheeks looked like in that instant. I froze in my little hiding spot, watching as Troyan exploded into another round of chuckles, her smile almost blinding. Who's the best boy? You are. They howled like two drunken teenagers, and I found myself grinning in spite of myself, too. Who's the best, ah Will, did you just poo? I let loose an unexpected gust of laughter slapping my hand over my mouth and ducking back into the kitchen as the nanny looked up. Hello, she called. Cindy. Ah shit. I heard her voice moving closer as she asked again, Cindy, are you here? I rushed toward the back stairs, hoping to make my escape before she realized I had been watching her. I knew there wasn't enough time. Instead, I snatched my cell off the counter and pressed it to my ear just as she entered. C-Y-N-O. And I don't care how long it takes. I yelled into my phone as if I was having a heated conversation, pretending I didn't see her standing there. Through my peripheral vision, I saw her turn to leave. With her walking away, I suddenly felt incredibly foolish. Why had I acted like that? Like some stupid kid avoiding his high school crush. Or like I'd been doing something I shouldn't have done. I was a grown man in my own house, yet I was sneaking around on eggshells. Enough was enough. I threw the cell back onto the counter and strode out into the foyer, where she was gathering Will in her arms. They must have just returned from a walk or something. Hey, I said as she moved toward the staircase. She glanced over her shoulder. Oh hi, she said. There was no warmth in her voice, but her gaze told a different story. Did I see her eyes rake over my bare arms and tank top covered chest? Let's just get something straight. This is my house, I spat. You're an employee, and not even one I hired. I don't need you skulking around, listening in on my conversations. The words felt wrong as soon as they left my lips, but I'd already started down this path. Her dark blonde brows knit together and she studied me warily, her eyes focused on my face now. I am aware of that she replied slowly. 
She seemed to hold Will closer to her body, angling him slightly away from me. The next words died on my lips. Why was she holding the baby like that? Was she afraid of me? Did she think I would hurt the baby? The idea was preposterous. I wasn't scary. I might be a little loud sometimes, maybe a bit brash, but I definitely wasn't someone to be feared. I didn't know you were in the kitchen, she offered when the silence became awkward. I thought you were Cindy. I nodded slowly, my eyes lowering. I couldn't quite identify the sensation flowing through me. Was it guilt? Shame? My gaze slid up toward the baby and he cooed at me, those bright blue eyes fixated directly on me. Is there anything else? Troyan's voice carried like pellets of ice shooting me in the face, but I couldn't find my own to reply. To save face, or at least what I thought was saving face, I shook my head and whirled away as if I'd had the last word. But as I sauntered up the back stairs, my mind whirling slightly, I tried to make sense of what had just happened there. Why had I faltered when I wanted to tell her to stay out of sight? It was my house, and I wasn't going to let Colette's stupid plan, no matter what it was, screw up the home I had created for myself. This will all be over soon, I assured myself as I walked into my office. I have the DNA kit coming in the next couple days. Either Colette will show up and collect her son, or the moment of truth will send the boy to CPS. Either way, I'll be free of this invisible restraint sooner or later. Until then, I just have to put up with this disruption in my life. I should have felt better about that, but I didn't for some reason. The sound of Troyan and Will's laughter echoed through my head, but it was cut off by the memory of the nanny's look of concern. She had been worried about the baby, maybe even for herself. I would never hurt anyone. I thought furiously, pounding my fist against the desk in anger. I'm not my stepdad. My hand was throbbing from the impact, and I looked at myself in the mirror above my desk, shaking my head. I needed to get my solitary life back, once and for all. I didn't need a kid, or a beautiful, pixie-eyed girl upsetting my balance. There were plenty of women around if I needed one, no matter what my crotch was thinking. Pushing thoughts of Troyan out of my mind, an even more disturbing train of thought took over. The blue of Will's eyes flooded my memory, and I flopped back into my chair, willing myself to think clearly, to focus on one subject at a time. Could the kid really be mine? Had I been too hasty in dismissing him? The blonde peach fuzz on his head was beginning to show the same golden hue as mine. True, Colette was a blonde too, but she wasn't as blonde as I. I rose from the desk, suddenly unable to sit still, and wandered toward the window overlooking the backyard. Unbelievably, Troyan and the baby were in the backyard by the pool, talking to Cindy while she tended to the gardens. How could that be, when I had just seen her going upstairs? Had she gone outside to avoid me? It was entirely plausible. She's everywhere, that woman, I thought in annoyance, but I didn't turn away. Just as I had in the hallway, I sat back slightly and peered at them from a distance, noting the way the sunlight glinted off Troyan's golden strands. She had slipped on a tank top over her bathing suit, her bronzed arms glistening as if she'd just applied sunscreen. I wondered if she was going for a swim, looking to the baby, as he stared adoringly at her from a blanket near the edge of the pool. She held one of his hands as she continued to chat with Cindy, her head moving gracefully to display the lines of her lean neck. Watching the way she moved, I was seized by the irresistible urge to run down there and sink my lips against the curve where her neck met her shoulders. What would she do if I snuck up behind her and kissed her, cupping my hands over her perky little breasts, which I know are dying to escape her bikini top? Would she slap my face? Or would she let me do it? My member touched the wall and I moaned slightly, slipping my hand around it, biting my lower lip. Down boy, I muttered to myself. You've got enough problems as it is. No need to create more but it seemed that my words had less and less effect on my aching member. He seemed to be vying for control, and something told me that my logic was not going to get in the way of his desire. Chapter 6 Troyan After our strange encounter in the kitchen, 
I started to notice Ash staring at me when he thought I couldn't see him. He'd lurk in the shadows of the house, as if he was trying to catch me making off with the silver candlesticks in the dining room. If he didn't trust me in his house, why didn't he just find someone new to watch Will? Why did he continue to stare at me with those brilliant blue eyes? He always looked at me with wariness and, what else was it I read in his glowering expression? It was difficult to pinpoint, but sometimes I swore it was lust. And it filled me with heat from head to toe. The thought that he might replace me filled me with panic though. I had grown so attached to the little boy and his infectious laughter over the past week. I wasn't any closer to learning about his mother, although I had tried to broach the subject a couple times with Cynthia. She immediately shut me down every time. She was loyal to Ash, a sealed vault when it came to whatever secrets lurked behind the walls of the Morris mansion. Every day after I sent the twins off to school, I rushed over to be with Will. When the weather was good, I took him in the stroller to the beach or the park, trying to avoid the tension that Ash seemed to cause with his very presence. But if I'd given it any thought, I'd have noticed that I took a little extra attention with my appearance in the mornings now. I'd even started putting on mascara, something that Lisa Thompson commented on one morning as I started next door. Aren't you all dolled up for babysitting, she taunted me, and I turned back to look at her. What do you mean? I don't think I've ever seen you wear makeup when caring for the twins. I blushed furiously and cursed myself for it. I didn't want her to read the embarrassment in my face. I have, I replied defensively. How's it going over there anyway? I keep meaning to ask Cindy if Ash got the results back yet. I blinked in confusion. The results? She eyed me and pursed her lips together. It's none of my business, she said quickly, reaching for her car keys. And it's certainly none of yours. She was gone before I could ask her another question, not that I thought she would give me any answers anyway, but I felt an unexpected stab of worry at her words. Was Ash sick? Was that why he acted so coldly towards everyone? Was it cancer? Something worse. A dozen bad thoughts flooded through my mind as I made my way toward the house, quietly slipping in through the back doors. Every morning I walked into the house that way into the kitchen where I expected to find Cindy feeding Will his breakfast. To my absolute shock, Ash was leaning over the baby in his high chair, speaking to him in a low voice. He hadn't heard me come in yet, and I watched in awe, stunned to see him so close to the boy. What was he doing? Goosebumps prickled over my arms as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. I had never seen him so close to Will, and it made me apprehensive. Straining my ears I tried to hear what he was saying, but I couldn't quite make out the words. All of a sudden Will threw his head back and began to howl, his little face red with rage. What are you doing? I yelled, striding toward the high chair. Ash spun and looked at me in surprise. Nothing, he replied defensively as I shoved past him to pick up Will. I was. I was just talking to him. I scoffed, huddling the baby to my chest. You haven't said a single word to him since I've been here and suddenly you're talking to him. What did you say to make him cry? I knew I had no right to speak to Ash like that. Even aside from the fact that I knew Will didn't understand any mean or bullying words Ash might have said to him, Ash was Will's father and he might even be dying. But my maternal instinct had kicked in and all the anger I'd felt toward him over the past week had reached a tipping point as Will sobbed in my arms. I, he seemed confused by the question. He stared at me, his eyes darkening as I continued to shush Will. Without answering, he turned and spun from the kitchen, his chiseled jaw tightening in anger. It's okay, Will, I cooed at him. Everything is fine. Have you had breakfast yet? He seemed to calm down as I put him back in his chair and found him some pureed peaches for breakfast. The second the spoon touched his puckered mouth, his mood lifted and he was back to his babbling self. He'd just been hungry. Shit. I'd already felt bad for my overreaction to Ash's presence, and this just made me feel worse. Oh. Don't tell me Ash left the baby alone. Cindy cried, hurrying into the kitchen with two paper grocery bags in hand. 
I left him alone for five minutes. I shook my head quickly. No, he was here when I came in, I replied, exhaling slowly. I just had to run to the store for diapers. Will's in his last one, and we both know how fast he'll go through that. I forced a laugh I wasn't feeling, a sense of guilt tickling my gut. Had Ash finally been sharing a moment with his son, and I'd ruined it with my suspicions. It certainly appeared that way. Are you okay? Cindy asked, and I realized I had spaced out for a minute. Yeah, I'm good, I replied quickly, turning my attention back to the baby. I was silent for a few minutes, making silly faces at will, but there was a question weighing heavily on my mind. Finally, I blurted it out. What test result is Mr. Morris waiting on? I didn't look at Cindy directly, pretending to be fixated on Will's bright eyes, but I could feel her stare burning into the back of my head. Who told you anything about test results, she demanded after a moment. It didn't take an expert to note the concern in her voice. Lisa had been onto something. Is he sick? I murmured softly, my eyes darting toward the doorway. I didn't want him to overhear me asking questions about him, questions that I had no right to ask. But the mystery was becoming too much to bear, and the more time I spent with Will, the more I knew I needed the truth about his parents. Both of them. Troyan, I like you, Cindy said shortly. I think you're a nice girl, and you've helped us out a lot. I wasn't stupid, I knew what that meant. I waited for the caveat. But Ash is your employer and you should know better than to ask questions about his personal life. I swallowed down the emotion in my throat, knowing that she was right, but unwilling to let it go. If Cindy wouldn't tell me, I would have to learn the truth another way. She had already spoken to Lisa about it. Maybe I could find a way to get the twins' mother to disclose whatever she knew. Will's well-being is my concern, I told myself, but I also knew that was just a weak justification for my nosiness. I was deeply bothered by the thought that Ash might be ill. He seemed so impenetrable, so strong. How many times had I envisioned my legs wrapped around his broad waist, his rock-hard abs pressed to my flat stomach? Too many. The idea that he might lose that power, the muscles, even his forbidding presence, in the aftermath of an illness? It was heartbreaking. What would happen to Will? My imagination was running amok, and it must have shown on my face as I stared off into nothingness, my heart thumping with sadness. Just when he seems to be coming around. Maybe that's why he's coming around. He's making peace with his son before he dies. You need to wipe that look off your face. Cindy grumbled, rolling her eyes as she approached the glass table where I sat feeding Will. I'm sorry, I mumbled. I was just thinking. You were making up silly tales in your head, Cindy corrected with exasperation. I could read it all over that innocent little mug of yours. No. I protested weakly, but she grinned. I'll tell you what's going on but you have to keep your mouth shut. This really is absolutely none of your business, but I think it's fair that you understand what's happening. I just don't think that Ash would agree. I lifted my head to stare at her wide eyes, nodding enthusiastically. I promise. I vowed. The secret is safe with me. She nodded slowly and sighed, sinking into the chair beside me. There's a reason that Ash has been so cold toward Will, she explained, and I cocked my head to the side. A quick flash of him leaning over to whisper to his son crossed my mind. Why? Is he dying? I asked before I could stop myself. Dying. Of course not, she laughed. The devil doesn't want Ash. She chuckled, but I wondered if there wasn't some truth to her words. Still, I was consumed with an immeasurable feeling of relief to learn he wasn't sick after all. No, Cindy continued. Ash is being so standoffish because he's not convinced Will is his son. My eyes bugged. What? I demanded. Why? That is a long story, and I'm not about to get into all the details, but he has good reason. You can't fault him for not wanting to get attached to a kid who might not be his in the end. I bobbed my head slowly, understanding it all with blinding clarity. So you need to cut him a little bit of slack, okay, Troyan? 
Yes, I replied, sitting back to stare at Will, the corners of my mouth twitching slightly. He'd have to be blind not to see the resemblance between him and this baby, I thought, as Cindy rose from the table to finish her morning routine. But I knew Ash wasn't blind. He was always watchful of everything around him, examining the world with those intense teal eyes. He was coming around, slowly but surely. I had witnessed it myself. My shoulders sagged as I exhaled the breath I'd been holding. I'd been hasty in judging Ash. He'd had his reasons for behaving as he had. And I owed him an apology for what had happened. I just hoped he would accept it. I would simply have to find a way to present it to him, in a way he couldn't refuse. Chapter 7 Ash I made my way down the front stairs, noting that the house was silent. I hadn't seen Troyan and Will by the pool, like they'd normally be just after noon, so I assumed they had gone to the beach. The house felt empty without the sound of baby coos echoing through the halls, and while I would never admit it aloud, I longed for the giggles of my son. My son. Shit. When did I start acknowledging that he belongs to me? Who was I kidding? I had been sneaking in every night to watch him sleep in his nursery on the main floor, often sitting with him for hours when my insomnia was at its peak. He would crawl around on the office floor in the evenings when Cindy was otherwise engaged, and I had finally gotten him to laugh the way Troyan did by pretending to play dead on the floor. Babies are so morbid, I thought affectionately, pushing my way into the library. I needed a specific book to finish my work and I was 90% certain I had a copy of it in my personal collection. If not, I'd need to check out Amazon. I started when I saw Troyan sitting in the room, her long legs draped over the arm of a wing chair, her shoulder-length hair cascading over the swell of her V-neck t-shirt. She heard me enter and quickly sat up, dropping her legs to the floor as if she'd been caught in a compromising position, her hands folding over the book in her lap. Oh, Mr. Morris, she gasped. I, I'm sorry. I was just reading. Her cheeks stained a pretty pink as she stood up. Where's Will? I asked, my eyes scanning the room for a glimpse of the baby, but he was obviously not there. Napping. He always naps at this time. I nodded slowly, stepping toward her as she gazed at me with nervous eyes. I'll get out of your way, she told me, moving to brush past, but I stopped her instantly my hand grasping the soft flesh of her upper arm. As if my hand was made of ice, her skin exploded into a rash of goose flesh, and her pupils constricted as she looked at me. You don't need to go anywhere. I meant the invitation to be an olive branch of a sort, but my voice came out much huskier than intended, bringing a new meaning to the words. Our gazes locked, and the electricity buzzing between us was tangible. I felt the heat emanating off her body, and I couldn't stop my eyes from raking over her face and across that delectable neck of hers. I saw her nipples pebble through the flimsy material of her shirt, and my eyes caught there for a moment. Was she wearing a bra? I was going to find out in a second, but I just needed to be sure. I was eager to get the go-ahead signal I'd been yearning for. She lifted her head to look up at me fully, her gray eyes the color of summer rain clouds. Her mouth parted slowly, her breaths quickening, as if she could see the events that were about to transpire playing behind her eyelids like a movie. Are you afraid of me? I asked gruffly, not releasing her arm. No, she whispered, but it wasn't a ringing endorsement. Why did the fact that she might be afraid of me send a surge of heat into my crotch? It made my desire to possess her even more powerful. I knew I would never hurt her but the uncertainty in her eyes was a driving force behind what I did next. I pulled her toward me, my mouth inches from hers, our eyes still engaged. I'm going to kiss you, I told her. She nodded, her pink tongue lolling out to wet her lower lip in anticipation. I brought my mouth down, crushing my lips to hers and she tried to gasp from the impact. My tongue jutted forward to touch the tip of hers, my fingers tightening against her arm as I whirled her forward to face me fully. I watched as her lids grew heavier until they closed entirely. Snaking my other arm around her waist, I yanked her into me, wanting her to feel the rush of heat in my shaft. 
Troyan sighed deeply and I nuzzled her cheek, my hand moving down to cup the firmness of her butt. She bucked forward slightly, and even through the material separating us, I felt the heat of her core. I wanted to taste her, every inch of her. Her flesh was already proving to be the honey I had anticipated, and I knew it would only get sweeter the lower I got. Abruptly, I pulled back, pushing her down into the armchair she'd been occupying just moments before. She fell gracefully, her slender thighs parting easily. Take off your shirt, I growled, and she nodded. I could see she was trembling as she lifted her top over her head. I groaned. She hadn't been wearing a brassiere. I buried my face in her chest, inhaling the coconut scent of her skin as I pulled down the waistband of her shorts. They slid off easily, exposing her creamy cleft, and I threw the clothing over my shoulders, followed by her calves. I pulled her forward, my palms spreading her cheeks from underneath as my lips found her belly button. Troyan's fingers entwined in my hair and she pushed me lower, a low moan escaping her lips. Arching her back, she urged me down and I could smell her sweetness even before my tongue lapped at the already pulsating button. Um, I murmured, my lips flush against her. You're soaked. She shivered, another round of goosebumps erupting on her flesh, and I dove into her, my tongue exploring every crevice of her core. Troyan yelped, her hands tightening over my blonde head, her hips moving rhythmically against my steady licks. Every taste made her wetter, and my eyes darted up to look at her without losing my groove. She seemed to be floating above herself, there but not there. Her tongue lolled out of her mouth and she mewled loudly, bucking up unexpectedly so hard she likely bruised my mouth. Still, I didn't stop, clenching her butt to keep her in place as she tensed. I, I'm coming, she cried, and satisfaction filled me as her words were closely followed by a stream of heat against my face. I continued to lap at her, relishing her little thrusts upward, until she finally began to relax and settle back to earth but I wasn't finished with her, not yet. Slowly, I raised my mouth over her belly again, my face drenched in her juices. I allowed her to lower her legs to the floor, moving my waist up to meet hers as I pushed my pants to the floor, boxers tangled within. Our faces just inches apart, I stared at her, watching her dazed eyes widen further as the tip of my shaft teased her swollen nub. Oh my, she mumbled, twitching slightly as I rubbed my tumescent member over her most sensitive spot. Do you want it? I whispered, and she nodded eagerly. Oh yes, she moaned. Please. I smiled, pushing her thighs apart. With no further warning, I jammed my engorged member inside her, savoring the sound of her screams. Oh shit, she gasped, nails digging into my shoulders for support. You're huge. I filled her entirely, feeling the walls of her center lock around me, and I stifled a groan. I was too excited. I had wanted her for too long. But I couldn't stop, not now, not when I had her exactly where I needed her, begging for more as she squirmed beneath me. Troyan's legs lifted again, this time to wrap around my waist. With her lower limbs holding me tightly, I plunged into her with swift, full movements. She gasped, disbelief clouding her eyes, and my sack tightened as it slapped at her clenching butt with every thrust. I couldn't hold out much longer. Actually, I couldn't hold out at all, but I wanted to feel Troyan around my unit before I exploded. I closed my eyes, willing myself to hold off, but it was an exercise in futility, I needed release. As I exploded inside her, my jaw tensed and Troyan shrieked, clenching at me furiously. It was only then that I realized she was coming again. I held fast to her slim waist as she squeezed every drop out of me, her calves clinging to my back under her crossed ankles. Our breaths were ragged but somehow matched in their unevenness, and I finally allowed myself to slip out of her, studying her face intently as I did. Was there any regret there? Any second thoughts? Before I could open my mouth to ask any of the questions that were popping through my head, Will began to fuss through the baby monitor. Instantly, Troyan jumped to attention. Even through my haze of satisfaction, I was impressed by how quickly she was able to find her clothes. Will hadn't even started crying yet, and she was fully dressed, glancing at me apologetically. Sorry, she said. I should go give him his lunch before he becomes inconsolable. 
I nodded, reaching for my pants. That's a good idea, I agreed. Why don't you grab him, and I'll take you both out for lunch on the beach. Her jaw parted. Uh, yeah of course, she mumbled, clearly stunned by the invitation. I, I'll just get him ready. I slipped on my pants, and followed her out of the study. I'll help you, I told her, and she glanced at me in shock, thankfully making no other comment. She had every reason to look at me like that. I hadn't exactly been the model father to Will, but if the past few days had taught me anything, it was that tiny babies could bring forth a lot of enjoyment. I didn't need a DNA test to know that Will was my son. Colette wouldn't have left the child with someone she wasn't sure was his father, no matter how wacky she was. I had been fighting a connection with my own son, and he didn't deserve that. And besides, it was an impossible fight. If Colette never came back, I would be happy to raise the baby on my own. Well, not all alone. I'll have Cindy helping. I watched as Troyan picked up the half-asleep infant from his crib and laid him on the change table, making teasing sounds at him as Will peered at her affectionately. Looking at her taking care of my son, I felt a strange tug at my heartstrings. Shit. Looked like my son wasn't the only person I'd bonded with against my best efforts, no matter how foolish those efforts might have been. I had inadvertently developed feelings for the nanny too, but for some reason, that didn't bother me as much as I thought it should. In fact, as I stood there watching them together, I suddenly realized there was very little I wanted more than to keep Troyan with us. I wonder how the Thompsons are going to feel about that, I thought wryly. Chapter 8 Troyan After our heated encounter in the library, our lives seemed to do an incredible 180-degree turn. Even Cindy was shocked at how attentive Ash seemed to be toward Will. What I wasn't sure of was whether or not she suspected that Ash and I had been using Will's nap times for afternoon delights of our own. Every night after the twins went to bed, and I was sure that the Thompsons wouldn't be looking for me, I would inevitably slip back over to Ash's house. Sometimes I'd stay there until the wee hours of the morning, before finally sneaking back home, before the twins woke up again. We weren't exactly being discreet, but we didn't go out of our way to flaunt our newfound relationship either. However, Cindy was a smart woman. She'd probably figured it out, but as she had instructed me what felt like a lifetime ago, she didn't get involved with the comings and goings of her employer. Lisa Thompson, though, was another story. What is going on with you and Ash Morris? she demanded one night as I slipped down the stairs. I hadn't realized that she was still on the main floor, and I froze in my tracks at the sound of her voice. I gaped at her, unsure of how to answer the question. Ash and I hadn't discussed what we would tell people, but I knew instinctively that telling my employers that I was engaging in an affair with my other employer would not look good. What do you mean? I asked, shifting my eyes away so she wouldn't read the blatant guilt on my face. He's asking if you can work for him full-time now. I stared at her in shock. That was not something we had discussed. I should have been annoyed that he'd asked her without clearing it with me first, but I couldn't deny that I felt a smidgen of pleasure that he'd thought about it. Well? Lisa snapped. What do you have to say about this? I thought quickly. Honestly, he never asked me, I told her truthfully but I can understand why he might feel he needs a full-time nanny. I think Cindy's already dealing with more than she can handle. My boss's brown eyes narrowed, and she looked me over as if seeing me for the first time. Hum, she replied. Why do I get the impression that there's more to the story than that? I don't know what you mean, I said quickly. What are you doing down here, she asked, and I tensed. I was just going out to Starbucks, I lied want anything. A cold smile formed on her lips. No thank you. But maybe you should ask Ash if he wants anything before you go though. She brushed past me and headed up the stairs, leaving me with the feeling that I'd just been caught with my hand in the cookie jar. I should just tell her the truth, I thought, but I didn't want to go that route. Not yet. The last week had been going so smoothly at the Morris house, and while I didn't doubt that Ash was into me, I couldn't guarantee that things would work out. 
I certainly wasn't about to move into his house as his employee while we were lovers. Maybe I could split my time better between the Thompsons and Ash though. Why did I feel like I was being pulled in two opposite directions? We all had the same goal, didn't we? Taking care of the kids. The twins' routine had remained the same, and on the weekends, I brought Will with me to the Thompsons to play with Sammy and Coral. Maybe Lisa is mad because the twins keep asking for a sibling now that they've met Will, I thought, making my way outside toward Ash's estate. I thought I could feel eyes watching me as I snuck through the walkway, but I didn't bother to turn around and look. I had nothing to hide, not really. The Thompsons might not like the idea of me dating Ash, but I still took damned good care of their children. Hey babe, Ash called when I walked into the foyer. I just ordered Thai food. You hungry? A little, I agreed. Did you talk to Mrs. Thompson about having me come here full time? He looked at me in surprise. It's sort of the next step, isn't it? He asked. Moving in together? His tone was teasing, but I thought I saw a hint of wistfulness in his eyes. I don't think she's happy about you trying to poach me, I explained, following him into the living room. Don't forget, she pimped me out to you in the first place. Ash scowled at the word. Don't say that, he growled. And yes, I remember that she offered your services, but according to Cindy, that's because you were driving her housekeeper crazy during the day. I could have hired my own nanny if Cindy didn't want to look after Will. I pursed my lips together and studied his handsome profile. Instinctively, I reached out to touch the line of his jaw, turning his head toward me for a kiss. It seemed almost impossible to keep my hands off him now that I had free reign and I didn't want to miss an opportunity to take advantage of the privilege. You don't waste any time, do you? He teased, stepping into me. I raised my head for a kiss, and the now familiar chills flooded my body as his mouth touched mine. I didn't know what it was about him that made me melt on contact. Perhaps it was the fact that I had followed him with my eyes for over a year, yearning to know what he felt like beneath his shirt. He joked with me, but the heat of his groin against my thigh told me I had exactly the same effect on him. I sighed deeply, feeling his hand curl into my hair and yank my head to the side to allow for his kisses. He latched on, sucking against the soft skin of my throat. I struggled to get away, knowing he would leave a hickey, again. But that was part of his game. He liked marking me and making me squirm, and I'd have been lying if I said I didn't love it too. You are such trouble, I grunted. As the words left my lips, he spun me around without warning, bending me over the back of the sofa. My mini skirt rose over the line of my butt, his left hand easily sweeping between my thighs. Already hot, he purred. Right on schedule. I was pinned against the cool leather as his hands continued to explore my center, fingertips probing at the dampness, sliding under my underwear and slipping back and forth until his index finger rested on my throbbing button. Groaning, I tried to watch him over my shoulder but his grip tensed in my hair, pushing my face against the red leather cushions so he could work me some more. A familiar tingle mounted in my belly. He knew that too, but it didn't stop Ash from continuing the pleasurable torture of manipulating my button, building my excitement as I begged him for release. Please. I moaned. Why do you torture me? You are just so delicious, was his response. I love to keep you in limbo, pleading for more. I wondered if his touch would ever lose its novelty, but I doubted it. Not when I turned into butter with even the slightest contact. For several minutes, I twisted under his grasp, bucking my heated cheeks back against him, trying to encourage him inside me. I moaned and panted, a line of sweat forming on my brow, but he wasn't relenting. Ash was determined to make me wriggle like a worm on a hook. Oh baby please. Two fingers slipped inside me without warning, and I cried out at the suddenness of the motion, but I knew he was going to finish me, finally. His digits probed me feeling my slick core as he brought me toward my peak, his thumb rubbing the sensitive skin of my button. Come for me now, he ordered. I did not need a second command. A hot gush flowed from me and I mewled, my knees knocking against the back of the sofa. He finished me easily, 
withdrawing his hands from my crotch and releasing my hair as I gasped with pleasure. I watched him over my shoulder, his eyes locking on mine as he licked his drenched fingers one by one. Take me, I whispered but as I said the words the intercom buzzed. He shrugged nonchalantly, spinning away. Sorry. Food's here, he said flippantly. I gaped after him, wondering how he could simply walk away from me splayed out like this when I knew he had to be sporting a raging hard-on. I shook my head in disbelief, rising up awkwardly to straighten myself before the delivery man showed up at the door. I could smell the scent of me filling the room, and I was instantly embarrassed. I hoped Cynthia wasn't home. I hadn't exactly been quiet. Well, I reasoned, if she's home and didn't know about us before, she definitely does now. Ash reappeared with a takeout in his hands. Let's eat this in the kitchen, he suggested. In case Will wakes up. I nodded and followed him toward the back of the house, pausing to look in on the baby as he set up the food. Hi, little guy, I cooed, stroking his cheek softly as he slept. Babies always looked like cherubs when they were asleep. I could watch Will all night, his sweet mouth parted and moving slightly as if he was suckling on his soother. Would it be so bad to move in here full time and take care of him? It would certainly be easier than doing it from the Thompsons, and the twins certainly didn't need me as much as Will did. Reluctantly, I turned away to leave him under his mobile and joined Ash in the kitchen. I've made a decision, I said as I entered. Oh yeah. What's that? he asked, searching through the drawers for some utensils. I'm willing to move in here full-time to take care of Will. Ash stopped what he was doing and looked at me, a slow smile forming on his lips. Oh you silly girl, he laughed. I didn't want you to move in here to take care of Will. I blinked, a hot flush of humiliation flooding my face. Oh, I muttered. I, I thought. I wanted you to move in here to take care of me, he cut me off, his grin widening. I exhaled with relief. Oh, I'll take care of you all right, I replied laughing. Chapter 9 Troyan In the light of day, maybe my decision to stay with Ash wasn't the best. I'd made it while I was physically turned on and not thinking clearly, and I hadn't really thought about how I was going to tell the Thompsons. I knew that it wasn't going to go over very well, but it had to be done. After I dropped the twins at school, I returned home instead of going directly to Ash's house. Lisa wasn't home but Nathan was, and I counted myself lucky. Of the two, he was probably the more reasonable, but who could really say? Troyan. Shouldn't you be next door? Mr. Thompson asked as I knocked on the door of his study. I'm going in a minute, I told him. But I need to discuss something with you and Mrs. Thompson first. Is she going to be home tonight? Oh, she didn't tell you. She's in New York until next weekend, and I'm off to Seattle for three days. It's just you and the kids starting tomorrow. Is everything okay? Can you just talk to me? Shit. Oh, okay, I said turning to leave. No, everything is fine. It can wait. Are you sure? He called after me, but I nodded. Of course. Troyan. I turned back to him reluctantly. Yes? I think I know what this is about, he said slowly. And I have to say, I don't think it's a very good idea. I swallowed a reply as I stared at him. Troyan, you're a grown woman and you can make your own choices, he continued, and I grew tenser with each word he spoke but I fear you're not thinking with the right organ in this matter. Mr. Thompson, I'm not sure what you think I wanted to discuss but I assure you, it's nothing to worry about. Troyan, if you want to change jobs, that's none of my business. Obviously, Sammy and Coral adore you, and we would be very unhappy to see you go, but that is ultimately your choice. But if you're doing it because… I'm not changing jobs. I interrupted in a panic. The last thing I wanted was for the Thompsons to think I was leaving them. I had invested over a year of my life into their household. Mr. Thompson's brow furrowed in confusion. Oh, he said. I thought you were leaving us to move into Morris's household. I shook my head vehemently. 
that's not what I wanted to talk about, I lied. Oh. Well, pardon me for being so presumptuous. I should have known you were much too smart to leave a good job to go chasing after a man you hardly know. I frowned. With all due respect, Mr. Thompson, I am 21 years old. I can make adult decisions about who I date. I agree, he replied, throwing his hands up in mock surrender. But you should probably be better informed about a man before you move into his house, wouldn't you agree? I didn't know what to say. Was he trying to warn me about Ash in some convoluted way, or was he just speaking as a concerned employer? I didn't ask because I didn't want to have that conversation with Nathan Thompson. I was sure my cheeks were already crimson with embarrassment. Forcing a smile, I shrugged my slim shoulders. Well, like I said, that wasn't what I wanted to talk about. Have a good day, Mr. Thompson. I was gone before he could say anything else. As I hurried through the house, I realized that my hands were shaking. Was there anything to worry about? How could I know? I knew so little about Ash Morris, except that it felt so right to be with him. But Mr. Thompson is right. There's no need to rush into this. It really could wait. For weeks, I had been dividing my time between the two households. But as Ash had said the other day, it wasn't like the move was only about watching Will. Most nights, in fact, it was Ash who got up if Will woke. He was the one who fed the baby breakfast in the morning, and he even changed diapers. I don't know what you need me for, I sighed. You've got this down to a science. You know exactly why I need you, he retorted, his voice gruff. It was that tone that sent shivers through my body every time. I loved it when he growled in my ear when we were making love. The move will keep, I thought, making my way over to the house with a skip in my step like some love-struck teenager. And Ash won't force the issue if he thinks I'm not ready. Good morning. I chirped as I opened the French doors into the kitchen. Where are my favorite men? I was met with silence, so I padded toward Will's room, my ears honed for signs of life in the house. Hello. I pushed open the door to the nursery. It was empty. Ash. Cindy. A weird feeling of dread tickled my belly as I continued through the hall. I headed toward the front entranceway, but I still saw no one. Was there a doctor's appointment I had forgotten about? It didn't seem likely. I was a nanny for a reason. I could remember scheduled appointments without effort. I glanced out the front door and saw that the car Ash usually drove was in the driveway, morning dew still touching the hood of his Mercedes. Hello. I reasoned that Ash must have taken Will up into his suite while he got ready. Cindy was probably at the store. I climbed the stairs toward the second floor, but as I approached the closed bedroom door I heard nothing. Ash? I pushed open the door to the bedroom. The sitting room was empty but the television mounted on the wall was on, albeit on mute. Ash? Yeah. His voice startled me, and I hurried through the front room and up the few steps to the bedroom. Ash was lying on the bed, staring up at the ceiling blankly. A single sheet of paper lay at his side. Are you sick? What's going on? I demanded. Where's Will? He didn't answer and I slid onto the bed beside him, peering worriedly at his face. He was unusually pale. Ash. I snapped, pushing his face toward me. Where is Will? What's wrong? He smiled at me, but there was not a single trace of mirth or humor in it. He's gone. My blood turned to ice chips. What do you mean gone? I demanded, leaping from the bed. His mother came for him. He chuckled. No one knows where she went, and I think it's pretty clear she's not coming back for him. I don't understand. I yelled. Where has he gone? Fear tickled my stomach. Had he done something to Will? I shoved the wicked thought out of my mind and tried to focus on what he was saying. Where did he go? I asked again, a pleading note in my voice. Please tell me what's going on. He didn't reply, but he tossed the paper laying at his side at me. I snatched it up, wondering what it could possibly say. 
I stared at it uncomprehendingly. What the hell is this, Ash? Please talk to me. I was becoming hysterical, his deadpan expression alarming me in the worst way. The sheet was from a lab. The markers meant nothing to me as I tried to make sense of it. It's the DNA test I sent away for, he sighed. Will isn't my kid, Troyan. I felt like someone had knocked the wind completely out of my gut, and I bit on my lower lip as a sob threatened to escape. Oh my. I sank back beside him on the bed, where he remained on his back. When did you get this? I asked. This morning. Last night. Shame washed over me. It was the first night in weeks that I had not gone to him, opting instead to catch up on some much-needed sleep. I should have been here. Of all the nights not to come. Why didn't you call me? I whispered, curling up beside him. To my utter shock and bewilderment, he pushed me away. Why, he laughed, turning his back to me. What could you do? I could have been here for you. I retorted, sitting up. Where is Will now? I called CPS to come and get him. Just when I thought I had reached the pinnacle of shock. You what? I choked. Why? Why would you do that? Suddenly, Ash sat up and glowered at me, his face contorted into a mask of fury. Didn't you just hear what I said, Troyan? He's not my kid. I know, but... I've had that baby here for weeks, and he belongs to someone else. It's kidnapping, Troyan. I had to. It's not kidnapping, I whispered, tears brimming in my eyes. His mother left Will with you. And now I'm leaving the kid with CPS. I was speechless, my head swimming with anger and denial that he would do this. But at the same time, what choice did he really have? Get out, Troyan. I want to be alone, he muttered. No. I cried. I'm not leaving you alone. You are, he snapped back, his eyes flashing with malice. I don't want you here. The words stung, but I gulped back my protests, knowing that he was in far more pain than anything he could inflict on me. Ash! Did you not hear me, he snarled. I don't need you here, Troyan. I have no use for a nanny anymore. Get out of here and don't come back. Aghast, I gawked at him. But he ignored me falling back onto the bed and deliberately turning his back to me, dismissing me entirely. Gnawing on my lower lip, I backed out of the bedroom. I didn't allow my tears to fall until I hit the sitting room. He just needs time to process what's happened, I told myself. He'll call me when he's ready, and we'll get through this together. But as I ran from his house, my face streaked with tears, I wondered if that was true. He had finally let his guard down and let Will into his life. He'd let me into his life, had learned how to love his son and me as well, and now that child was gone. How could we hope to survive this? Chapter 10 Ash The days floated by after Will was taken away, one melting into the next. My investors were calling non-stop about the app, but I didn't have the drive to work. If not for Cindy, I probably wouldn't have eaten either. Troyan called a lot in the first few days, but even her calls tapered off. I wasn't being fair to her, and I knew it, but I couldn't do anything to change it. The problem was, I couldn't think of Troyan without thinking about Will. I had gotten to know them together, as if they were the perfect little family, hand delivered to me, to make up for my own shitty childhood. Without Will, it was impossible to look at Troyan. The pain was just too great. You have to stop beating yourself up, Cindy told me softly. There was no way you could have known. He looked exactly like. I don't want to talk about it, Cynthia. Close the door on your way out. She grimaced but stood her ground. At least take a shower, Ash. You stink. I scowled at her suggestion. Who the hell did I need to take a shower for? Troyan. Will. I lay in bed for a solid week, before I finally snapped out of it long enough to take Cindy's advice and shower. I almost felt human again when I emerged, but my heart was broken in so many ways. A simple shower couldn't fix that. I knew I should at least call Troyan, 
but even the thought of hearing her voice was too much. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I would eventually, or at least that was what I told myself. But first I had to cope with the devastation of losing a child who was not even mine to begin with. Oh good. You're done moping, Cindy called when she saw me. Come and eat lunch. She gestured at the kitchen island, and I reluctantly shuffled toward it, sitting on the stool. What are you going to do now? She asked as she riffled through the fridge, looking for ingredients to make a sandwich. Do. I echoed. About what? Are you going to call CPS and find out what the hell has happened to your son since they picked him up? I bristled. He's not my son. I roared and she eyed me with naked disdain. You are such a child, you know that. No wonder you fell for the nanny, you need someone to take care of you. I gaped at her. I am not a child. I snapped. I am stating the facts. Will is not my child. Sharing DNA doesn't make him your kid you complete dumbass, she sighed. Waking up in the middle of the night with him makes you a dad. Doing that stupid Gangnam style dance over and over just to get him to laugh. That's being a dad. You're so hung up on DNA, you don't even know what it means to be a dad. You're the only dad that kid has ever had. I ground my teeth together, feeling a familiar burning behind my eyelids. I'm not the one who's hung up on DNA. I can't just keep a kid because someone left him here. He is a real dad out there somewhere. No, she agreed. But you can at least call and find out what the hell happened to him. See if he's been returned to his parents, or if he's floating around the foster care system somewhere. I inhaled sharply. What would happen to Will if Colette wasn't found? Or if she was found and deemed unfit? Would he just get tossed around the system? It made me sick to think that he might fall through the cracks and become just another forgotten child. Not when I had so much to give him here. I'll make the call, I said suddenly, jumping from the stool and reaching for the cordless phone. Cindy was right. Will was not my biological son but he was as much a part of me as my own heart. And if I could find a way to get Will back to me, maybe I could get my sense of family back, not only with him, but with Troyan also. What the hell are you waiting for? Cindy barked at me. Make the damned call. It took me a month to find out everything I needed to know about Will's whereabouts. I found out pretty quickly that he had been moved out of Virginia Beach. Waiting on phone calls to learn more, was one of the worst things I'd ever experienced in my life. But when I was finally put in touch with his caseworker in Richmond, I learned the heartbreaking news that he had not been reunited with his parents. Colette Martin seems to have disappeared off the radar completely, Susan Collins, Will's caseworker, explained through the phone. I have reports that she was heavily into drugs, so we don't anticipate a good outcome. The child's father is still unknown, however. I waited my spine so tense I thought it would snap in two. You are listed as the father on the birth certificate, Mr. Morris. I confess, I didn't know what that meant at first. But I'm not Will's biological father, I explained, sighing. No, she agreed. But the fact that you are listed as his father does give you rights as a legal guardian. Hot, cold, lukewarm, all the sensations I could imagine smothered me in that moment. What are you saying? Are you saying that I can have him back? I choked. He can come home. If you're willing to take him, yes. Yes. I screamed into the phone. Yes. Send him home. Where can I get him? Well, I still need to come out and do an evaluation of your home, she explained. But I don't think there will be any problems, Mr. Morris. Schedule it. I want my son back. I cried my heart hammering so loudly I was sure she could hear it through the phone. She chuckled dryly. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Morris. In my line of work, we don't get to see happy endings very often. After I ended the call, I sat at my desk, willing my nerves to settle down. I sent Cynthia a text. Will is coming home. Her response came just seconds later. Really? That's amazing, Ash. The caseworker needs to assess the house, 
but he's really coming, I sent off. There was a pause, but I could see that she was writing something, the three bubbles indicating a message was forthcoming. Isn't there someone else you should be sharing this news with? I stared at the message for a long time, but I didn't move. She was right, Troyan deserved to know what was going on. I hadn't even caught a glimpse of her outside in the past three weeks. I thought she might have been avoiding me on purpose, and honestly, I was a little glad that she'd done that. That didn't mean that I wasn't filled with loneliness, I longed to be with her every night. I missed her terribly, and I wanted nothing more than to tell her I'd been a fool for cutting her out. But I'd stopped myself, worried that I would just break her heart again if I found myself overwhelmed with melancholy. But now, I didn't need to worry. Our family was going to be reunited again. Will she forgive me after all this time? There was only one way to find out. I pushed back my office chair and raced down the center stairs and out into the bright southern sunshine. It felt like a day for renewals, for fresh starts. The sun was going to wash away all the gloom and sadness that had filled the halls of the mansion. All the stolen laughter was about to be replaced. I rang the intercom at the Thompson's place and waited, glancing at my watch. It was eleven o'clock, and I could see that the minivan was parked in the circle drive near the front door. Hello. Lisa. It's Ash Morris. There was a long pause. Hello, Ash. Is everything all right? Yes. For the first time in a long time, I replied honestly. Is Troyan home? There was another, longer silence. Lisa. Are you still there? I'm here, Ash, but Troyan isn't. Oh. When will she be back? Dead pause. Lisa. She's not coming back, Ash. She left two weeks ago. I paled. What? Where did she go? I demanded. Did she leave a forwarding address? No. The way she said it made me believe she might know something. Lisa, please tell me what you know. It's important. A huge sigh crackled over the intercom. I think she went home to her parents in Norfolk. Thanks, Lisa, I murmured, turning away. I was too late. I had been stubborn and stupid and let her go, and now she was gone for good. Will and I wouldn't be a true family without Troyan. I had to find her. Chapter 11 Troyan There is nothing more humiliating to a grown woman than crawling back to her parents with her tail between her legs. Unfortunately, I didn't have much of a choice in the matter. My mom was thrilled to see me, while my dad met me with his I told you so face. See. You should have just gone to college like we told you, dad declared, eyeing me from over his newspaper. Look at you, you've gotten lazy. You haven't been exercising, have you? Rob, leave her alone, my mom scowled, throwing her arms around my shoulders. You look healthy, sweetie. Your cheeks are pink and glowing. I felt like shit, but it was a feeling I'd gotten used to over the past six weeks. Being kicked to the curb like yesterday's trash was not a good feeling, especially when I'd known all along that Ash Morris was a jerk. My weakness had caused me to lose my job, had set me way back on my path toward my goal, and had obliterated my own self-respect. Even knowing all that, I still longed for Will's infectious baby giggles and Ash's hard body against mine. I hated myself for missing him. You don't miss him, I reminded myself. You miss the guy you thought he was. Ash Morris is not someone you should miss. But when I closed my eyes, I could see the intensity of his blue eyes staring back at me, burning holes through me as if he could see clean into my soul. I'd been home for two weeks when mom started getting antsy. It was to be expected, and I couldn't sit around the cottage-style house forever, pretending that the world outside didn't exist. So, honey, she asked sweetly. What are you planning to do, now that you're home? I smirked at her, from my spot on the rocking chair where I'd been reading a James Patterson novel. Is that your way of asking me when I'm leaving? Mom looked horrified at the thought. No. I am so glad you're back. You can stay as long as you want, she assured me. I knew she meant it, 
even if dad would happily have left me at the circus at the first opportunity. I'm just wondering if you have any plans. Do you have enough saved up for college now? The sardonic grin on my face widened. Oh, I have enough for college, I told her. But I'm not going to be using it for college. Her brow furrowed in confusion. Why not? Because, Mom, I'm... Troyan. My head whipped to the side. Am I hallucinating? Oh, is this a friend of yours, honey? Mom asked, smiling warmly at Ash as he approached. Hi, I'm Maddie Carpenter, Troyan's mom. Hello, Mrs. Carpenter. Ash Morris. I watched in disbelief as they shook hands. Ash, what are you doing here? I demanded nervously. You shouldn't be here. Yes, I should be. I glanced at my mom, who was beaming like a simpleton at the handsome stranger on her front porch. Mom, can you give us a minute? I sighed. Sure. I'll bring you some homemade sweet tea. I think I've got some cookies too. Great. Thanks, Mom, I muttered, watching her disappear through the screen door. What are you doing here? I demanded. Please leave, Ash. I have nothing to say to you. Not anymore. It was far too late. I couldn't go crawling back to him after a month and a half of silence, not now. I would never trust him again. Didn't he know that I'd lost Will too? Was he that selfish? I'm an asshole, Ash said. Well, that was a start. I stared at him, my gray eyes narrowing. Go on. He grinned at me sheepishly. Will is coming home, he explained. I've been trying to hunt him down since, well, for a while. Since you told me, you didn't need a nanny anymore. Are you here because you need a nanny again? My tone was cold, but I was elated by the news. Not a day had gone by that I didn't worry about the baby, and now I knew he was where he belonged. No, I'm here because I need my family back together. The words filled me with an unexpected wave of affection and longing, and I found myself softening in spite of myself. I was so hurt, Ash sighed. So hurt. I didn't even leave my room for a week. The pain in his voice was palpable and I lowered my eyes, knowing I didn't want to get sucked into this. But the desolation in his words. I couldn't bear the thought of looking at you, Troyan. It was selfish and wrong, but I was devastated. He exhaled deeply. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I did need to find you and tell you that I am sorry for how we left things. You and Will are the closest thing to a family I've ever had in my life, and I would do anything to save that. I raised my eyes and nodded slowly, chewing on my lower lip. Why did you leave the Thompsons, he asked when I still didn't speak. I was shocked you were gone. Was it because of me, Troyan? Because you shouldn't have to give up your job because of me. Well I did, I replied flatly. He shook his head ruefully, and I rose slowly from the rocker, my book falling to the floor. I'm sorry, he mumbled as I approached. I made a mess out of everything. Go back to the Thompsons and I promise you, I won't bother you. I. Stop talking, I instructed, clasping his hands and sliding them over my waist. But Troyan, we need to talk this through. I had to leave because I'm pregnant with your child, Ash. I heard the crash of silver behind me and realized my mom had been listening at the doorway, but I didn't care. I didn't tear my eyes away from Ash's shocked face. What? he gasped. You are. I nodded slowly, placing his palms over my still flat belly. Is there room for one more in our family? I breathed, suddenly feeling unaccountably shy. Hell yes, he howled, lifting me off my feet and swinging me around until I squealed. Troyan Grace Carpenter, can you please come inside for a moment? My mother gasped from behind me. I swallowed a smile. Ash put me on my feet and we grinned at each other. I better deal with the fallout, I said. Hey, he called as I turned away to deal with my mom. Hum. I love you. I nodded slowly, my eyes shining. I love you, I replied, and I meant it. The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook. 
Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel.